Mr. Speaker, I rise today as a proud adoptee, a son with two loving parents who provided me with all the love and support a child could ever ask for. But yet, I heard in this chamber a few days ago that someone's saying my parents aren't real parents. Are you a mother? I am a mother by marriage. By marriage, I see. Um, and and my wife is here with me, so. The problem is, is people like you need to admit that you're just a political activist, not Gentle a teacher, lady, is not a mother, and not a medical doctor. Let me be clear. I am their child. They are my parents. And for bigoted, closed-minded reason, certain folks have decided that people who adopt their children are lesser than. But make no mistake, whether you adopted your child, had biological children, or found your chosen family in some other way, you are a parent. And because I haven't seen any of my Republican colleagues in this chamber condemn these disgusting comments, I hope, I hope that they don't also agree with it. Because I won't allow anyone in this chamber to disrespect my family or yours. And directly to the people who have opened up their hearts and homes to children ready for their embrace, don't let anyone ever diminish who you are. You are real parents, a parent and nothing less. I yield back. It's clear they have a climate religion. They worship the earth. Well, I worship the creator, not the creation. Instead of screaming orange man bad on Tic Tac, maybe they should come up with some real solutions because that isn't going to solve the problems that America is facing. In this bill, Republicans are burying their heads in the oil-covered sand and requiring more oil lease sales in the area. I, feel for, I fear for the health of my community. H.R. 1 is not about what's right for their constituents, working people, or what's right for the earth. It's about what's right for oil and gas executives getting rich up polluting our planet. Joe Biden does have a plan. His plan was to deliberately open our borders and cede power to the cartels. What's, what is the answer to this mess for Biden and the Democrats? More Big Brother? More control? Even changing our culture? You know, it's unfortunate that this hearing started off with a ton of hyperbole and posturing, saying that President Biden and his administration have created the worst border crisis in American history. That isn't about oversight. It's about stoking the fears of immigrants and those seeking asylum. And it's something I take personally as a son of a Cuban refugee. For two years of campaigning, we've heard about the border, the border, the border. And here we are, and yet we're not being solutions oriented. It's hyperbole and lies. More people are on telework than are actually allowed by the guidelines. You're saying some people can't come to work. I mean, it's just an, an insult to the hardworking people of this country. Requests for updates on actual cases by email and phone go unreturned, and our constituents feel like no one can help them. House Republicans' first act in this Congress was to pass a bill to el eliminate the 87,000 new IRS agents from the Inflation Reduction Act, something that would Something that would ensure, here, you hear that, people watching at home, they're clapping when we're talking about people who will help you get your information on a timely manner, answer the phones, and process what needs to be done. And that's really important to know. That's what's being clapped, uh, clapped about right now. This is rich. It's, it's ironic, um, and it has no one fooled. This is to distract from the real sp special interest group that is the real threat to children all across this country, the NRA. This is one of the greatest threats to kids in schools. This is one of the greatest threats to teachers um, and our families in the school system. Not whatever they're talking about right now to score political points, but the fact that our kids are being shot. That if your child, and I'm speaking to the parents of this country, God forbid if your child were to die before the age of 18, the most likely reason is because they were shot to death. I find that unacceptable, but Republicans on this committee do not. And that's why we're here today. There has been a push by powerful teacher unions, left-wing politicians, and most concerning, the Biden Justice Department to silence parents throughout our country. Parents want schools focused on reading, writing, and math, not woke politics. The radical left in our country seeks to silence parents and use public schools and colleges to indoctrinate our youth. They don't want to teach children how to think. They want to teach them what to think. I mean, if Republican lawmakers cared so much about what's happening in our schools, they would focus on feeding kids so we can ensure that everyone can learn on a full stomach. If Republican lawmakers cared so much about what's happening in our schools, they would make sure that students have updated technology, teachers have the resources they need so students can actually learn. 
If Republican lawmakers cared so much about what's happening in schools, what about the kids who are gunned down in their classrooms? The leading cause of death in this country being uh, gun violence for young people. You know, my colleagues want us to feel so sorry for these people who took out these loans and are not going to pay them back. Universities that charge exorbitant amounts for humanities degrees in cultural Marxism should bear the responsibility when their graduates struggle to repay their loans due to a lack of viable employment opportunities. And I see you laughing over there. I don't think the people that are going to be left holding the bag, paying someone else's student loan debt are laughing. See, if we legislated using your logic, that because there was an injustice, we can't fix it because it's unfair to those who never had it fixed, means we would never progress on any issue in this country. Why do you bring that bigoted logic to this issue as it relates to students, but not any other issue? People. Uh, oh, 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 ma'am, ma'am. Okay. All right. Officer, uh, she goes. She goes go. Please remove that woman, please. Yes, officer, please. Don't even touch her. Don't even touch her. All right. Show the force She's really fine. I'm okay. I, I plan on acknowledging three people. Um, both of them are not in this room anymore. Um, folks who I've worked with and that I know, Manny and Patricia Oliver, who lost their son, Joaquin Oliver, in the Parkland shooting. To, to lose a child to gun violence, to see, the, to see the photos of your child sitting in a pool of blood, I, I, can't, I can't imagine that. Today, Republicans on this committee chose to sit in front of those parents and the survivors and organizers and advocates that are in the audience right now people who are reliving their trauma listening through this, people impacted by gun violence across the nation, and show that their priority is gun lobby money, manufacturers who profit up de uh, off death, and creating fake narratives for political gain. But there's a decorum that should be adhered to. So, Mr. Bosco, your brace is not a ghost gun, correct? <laughs> is this an insurrection? So will they be held to the same, uh, I don't want another January 6th, do we? Yeah, if they're Bosco. trying to overthrow the government, they ought to be held to the same standard, but I think they're trying to express their... Oh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Members out of line. Officers, can we have this woman removed, no, please? Point, we're in recess. She can speak all she wants. We're not, the hearing is not being inducted. We're in recess. We're in recess. She can speak as much as she wants. When you're gavel, that's a different story. I just heard one of my colleagues bring up the fact that this hearing is about a brace and it's not about gun violence or victims or anything like that. And I think it goes to show just how much people don't understand what it means to take a step back and look at an issue holistically. And that's why this is about everything. It's about victims. It's about the brace. It's about the families. It's about the fact that if you have a child in this country and God forbid they die before the age of 18, the most likely reason is because they were shot to death in this country in 2023. You know, Manny and Patricia have dedicated their lives to fighting for a world where true justice can be achieved because unfortunately, there is no justice for the dead and true justice is ensuring that this never happens again. I fight alongside Manny and Patricia Oliver. I believe that they are American heroes and what they always say is they don't want their son Joaquin to be remembered as a victim they want him to be remembered as an activist. Again, the leading cause of death for kids in America is guns. And today's hearing is about distracting the people from the truth. They want you to believe that the greater threat is the ATF and not the facts that are in front of us. We heard one of my colleagues bring up facts. Let's look at the facts, and I just said them. A hundred people a day. And I know it's easy to say a number and forget that behind every number, there's a human. There's a Joaquin Oliver. Enough is enough, not one more. And to all the organizers, advocates, survivors, and families here today, I'm so sorry that you've had to sit through this hearing. I'm so sorry that you had to see what happened outside to Manny and Patricia, 
who are just fighting for, uh, for, for a world where no other parents have to go through what they went through. And I, for one, believe this has nothing to do with policy and everything to do with politics. And I won't be listening to another second of it, and I wouldn't blame you all if you made the same decision. I yield back. For, for many folks around the country who might only watch far-right media or just listen to even some of the folks on this committee, I, I'm curious, uh, Chief Chavez, when President Biden took office, did your agents stop enforcing the border and just allow everybody to come in, thus creating what we hear here is, is an open border? Did that happen when the president took office? Sir, thank you for your question. Uh, the answer is no, sir. Okay, thank you. We continue to enforce policy and laws. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Chief Modlin, when President Biden took office, did the border just open and did you all stop enforcing your policies? Also, thank you for your question, sir. I, I can tell you this is the fifth administration I've worked for, starting with the Clinton administration, and Border Patrol agents do their job every day. Thank you. I appreciate it. Look, I mean, look, as y'all probably realize by now, a lot of these hearings are not really about solutions. They're about politics. And for me, I believe solutions must be rooted in facts. Um, I know y'all probably watch the news and are aware of what's going on politically. Would you agree that the narrative being peddled right now that says that an insane amount of fentanyl is being brought into this country by illegal immigrants, specifically, would you say that is true? Sir, again, we're here to report on the facts on, on border security. I, I probably differ from giving an opinion on anything in the news right With now. With the data, right? Because that, that's probably doubtful. I, I can't. Yeah. No, all good. Thank you, Chief. Statement. No, I, yeah. I appreciate it. I, I agree, right? It has to be rooted in the data. You know, a Cato Institute report and CBP data shows that more than 85% of the illicit fentanyl entering the United States is brought in by citizens of the United States of America. So, Mr. Chairman, I request unanimous consent to enter into the record the 2022 Cato Institute report demonstrating that illicit fentanyl is primarily trafficked by U.S. citizens at lawful ports of entry. Without objection. Thank you. Look, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would have us believe that the solution to the fentanyl problem in this country is to discourage both illegal and legal immigration. In comes the wall, which we've heard a lot about. You know, we know that crossings haven't decreased since we spent 15 billion, once again, 15 billion with a B, of taxpayer money on that monument of fear. Uh, the wall kind of reminds me of a sad, decaying Soviet statue. And I want to be clear, and we've heard this time and time and again, and I'll say it again. The situation deserves this committee's attention because there is a crisis at the border. But the crisis is not a criminal one. It's a humanitarian one. And it's an important fact to keep in mind. I appreciate y'all's work, and I yield back the balance of my time. This bill filed with dangerous, unpopular, and unnecessary, unnecessary policy will worsen our climate crisis, our existential climate crisis. And I'm part of a generation who has grown up with the very real fear that in our lifetimes we will all experience an unlivable planet, that we will lack breathable air and drinkable water, that our houses will be destroyed again and again from natural disasters, that we'll develop asthma and struggles to breathe, and that we'll have a shortage of food. And uh, sitting here, I've heard a lot from my colleagues repeating that we need to lower energy costs, that we need to lower energy costs. And my question is, where are the actions on ensuring that price gouging isn't happening at the pump, which is exactly why energy costs were high at the pump? I agree, but what about the, the real cost, the cost of life? And what we know is the cost of not doing anything is far greater than the cost of taking action right now. You might not be the ones paying for it but future generations will be. And I think a body like ours should be thinking about the future and the present. Many people around the globe are already experiencing these threats. Among them are farmers, farm workers, coastal communities, and community members who cannot afford air conditioning costs. I'd like to believe that out of compassion for my generation or our vulnerable communities, that Republican members of this body would come to the table and act in a bipartisan way to protect us from this fate. It is possible to create a green transition so we can preserve jobs and the planet and create a whole new economy, a green economy, with good paying union jobs for all of our people. We can invest in clean energy and train those working in the oil and gas industry so they can have new good paying jobs and fulfilling careers. We can do these things, but right now, my Republican colleagues aren't.
This bill would bring back the defunct Keystone XL pipeline, reversing President Biden's wise executive action that ended it. It rubber stamps the construction of even new pipelines. And not only is this bill not informed about what's best for the future, but it looks like they haven't learned from what happened in the past. This bill requires two new Gulf of Mexico oil lease sites this is very damaging to my home state of Florida, and I'm really glad to know, you know, it's been a tradition for both Democrats and Republicans from Florida to support no offshore drilling um, in the state of Florida. And so I'm looking forward to seeing all my Republican colleagues that are part of the Florida delegation voting no on this bill to keep intact with their word. I know one of the colleagues said this body is about integrity and keeping to our word. I look forward to seeing those no votes. In 2010, the Deepwater Horizon expulsion pumped 210 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, polluting more than 1,000 miles of Florida beaches with toxic oil. These literal waves of pollution closed beaches and deprived Floridians and visitors of 10 million beach days um, on our world-class beaches. The economic impact was real on our tourist industry was profound. The impact for our seafood industry was catastrophic, and no one wanted a meal coming from a poisonous sea. In this bill, Republicans are burying their heads in the oil-covered sand and requiring more oil lease sales in the area. I, feel for, I fear for the health of my community. Florida is in the middle of a climate change crossfire. We have rising seas that are creating higher and more destructive storms. We just had a Hurricane Ian last year, the deadliest hurricane in 100 years. Entire communities were completely decimated and wiped out. In Orlando, it caused flo flooding like we've never seen before, leaving constituents homeless. HR1 comes weeks after the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. This report makes it clear Continued greenhouse gas emissions will lead to destabilizing uh, global warming, and our only hope is rapid and sustained reductions in greenhouse gases. I heard a colleague blame Democrats for admissions. This is also not true, but I'm glad to hear he was impassioned about blaming Democrats with, uh, for increased admissions, which would lead me to believe that he agrees that we have to bring down admissions, which the report also says we have to do in, uh, uh, in a very quick way um, so we can have a livable planet. I will vote no on HR1, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. We can and we must do better than this, not just for us, but for future generations. I invite my Republican colleagues to abandon this harmful bill, come to the table and work in a bipartisan way on smart energy policy, because the decisions you make today will impact future generations and can condemn my entire generation to a lifetime of suffering and put us on a path towards an unlivable future. I hope we'll make the right decision. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in opposition to HR 5. I rise in opposition as someone who's actually been a student in our public school system within the last decade. I rise as someone who is the son of a public school educator, special education teacher of 37 years. Love you, Mom. And I also rise as someone who sat on my local school board for two years as the student representative. This, this bill is modeled after one that I know very well, uh, Florida's parental rights in the education law. Most of us know it as don't say gay. And don't say gay infringes on um, parents' rights, including LGBTQ plus and supportive parents. Bills like this make schools more hostile and make no mistake, it results in hate, bigotry, and yes, sometimes death of our students in schools. Republican lawmakers won't even allow my amendment to be considered that protects the First Amendment rights of parents. We want to talk about parental rights. What about their First Amendment right to fight for their children, LGBTQ plus children, who are fighting for gender affirming and life saving care? One of my colleagues brought this up, but this bill focuses on parents' rights. But what about the rights of our students? What about the rights of our young people? Why are my Republican colleagues not advocating for our students? Is it because they know that the majority of young people despise legislation like this and do not support legislation like this that is bigoted? Is it because this generation is the most progressive generation this country has ever seen because they want a world where everybody can succeed, where we see the world through the eyes of the most vulnerable? See, the party is branded on freedom and liberty, but what about the freedom and liberties of young people? and students who actually sit in the classroom. None of that is in this bill. This bill is just a vehicle for hate and political nonsense pushing a chosen wedge issue. It's not about policy, 
It's about politics. It's not about freedom and liberty. It's about the fear of a problem that doesn't exist. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During today's hearing, Republicans on this committee are attempting to paint the American Federation of Teachers as a destructive specialist interest group um, out to harm students. They are not. AFT represents our talented, generous, and compassionate educators who are the backbone of this nation's childcare and our children's home away from home. This is personal for me. My mother's been a public school educator for 37 years teaching special education. She actually retires this year. And look, I recognize that the pandemic has had real impacts on American children, but make no mistake, for a brief time in this country, children didn't have to memorize emergency exits. Children didn't have to practice active shooter drills more than they're doing fire drills. Children didn't have to walk around with a Kevlar backpack or figure out what they have to do if a shooter were to come into their classroom. Students are begging for Congress to have the courage to act on gun violence. If you care about students, if you care about schools, fight to, for a world where students are not dying in a pool of their own blood in the, in the classrooms that they're supposed to be learning in. If Republicans gave a damn about America's children, they would pass legislation to end gun violence, to keep students safe, to keep teachers safe, to keep administrators safe, and the staff at the schools. If Republicans gave a damn about the next generation, they wouldn't be actively trying to cut funding for your kid's school and turning a blind eye to the gun violence that's killing children every single day in this country. If they gave a damn about gun violence, they wouldn't be going after teachers over some emails about school safety from two years ago. Let me tell you what people are actually going through. My friend Manuel Oliver lost his son Joaquin in the Parkland shooting, Joaquin Oliver, um, in Parkland, Florida. And when I think about what our children are going through and the real threat to them, I think about the autopsy of Joaquin Oliver. I quote, a significant amount of bleeding. The bleeding went into his right chest cavity and started compressing his lungs. By basically drowning, he died in a pool of his own blood. That is what happened to Joaquin Oliver. That is the threat that our students are going through. 549 children and teens have already been lost to gun violence this year alone. And yet here we are, burying our heads in the sand, ignoring the problem, and refusing to put legislation on the floor. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much for being here today. What impact does a child living through mass shooting or other gun-related events have on their development, mental health, and ability to learn? Look, it's terrible. I mean, we represent the educators in, in Parkland and the educators in um, Sandy Hook. And uh, gun violence is the number one cause of death of kids. If we held an oversight hearing on this and invited survivors, teachers, students, parents, do you think that the committee would find that inaction in Congress on gun violence to be appropriate? How do you feel like the parents and the students would feel? Look, I hear from teachers and kids all the time. I, what this committee hasn't asked me is I, I've been in I think 147 work sites or 150 work sites between April 2021 and April 2023. I walk the walk with parents and teachers and children, and they are scared about gun violence and about the ready access of guns. They're scared. I hear it all the time. Yeah. Well, th thank you so much. Thank you for your work and thank you for your perspective on children, their overall health, well-being, and development. This is one of the greatest threats to kids in schools. This is one of the greatest threats to teachers um, and our families in the school system. Not whatever they're talking about right now to score political points, but the fact that our kids are being shot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to this resolution. And I want to say something. My Republican colleagues are pushing a narrative that student debt relief is unfair. And to my colleagues, I agree with you. I agree that what's going on is unfair. Folks who paid off their debt, the fact that they had to have it in the first place is unfair. The fact that students still have to take out crushing student debt just to get a college education, that is unfair. And if we legislated using the logic that you bring to this issue here today, women and black folks wouldn't have the right to vote because it would be unfair to those who never got to vote before them. Why do you bring that bigoted logic 
to this issue as it relates to students, but not any other issue? Demand is worth what taking we know. down. The gentleman will suspend. You said your bigoted logic. Let's take a seat. The clerk will report the words. Without objection. The offending words are withdrawn. The gentleman will proceed in order. If we used this logic on every single issue, we would never have progress on anything. And the truth of the matter is that young people and people don't have student debt because we live beyond our means. We have student debt because we've been denied the means to live. And it's important to understand that. Congress needs to help fix this damaged economy which gets more unequal and unequitable every single day. This bill today is not delivering that help. It's making things worse. And to people watching at home, to young people, to people with student debt, just know that the Republican Party here, my colleagues in this chamber, are fighting to take away the relief that you need and that you deserve. This is about fairness, and true fairness is ensuring that everyone has equitable opportunity. 20 million constituents robbed um, of relief by their own representatives is what this bill is about. I urge my colleagues to vote no, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Virginia reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized.